Good morning and welcome to Zion. Hope happens here. You belong here, we belong together. I'm Pastor Dwayne Jesse, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio, and today we are celebrating the second Sunday of Advent. Zion Lutheran Church is hosting live in-person corporate worship, and I want you to feel welcome to join us at either our blended service on Saturday at 5 p.m., or our traditional Lutheran liturgical service on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. It is sharing tree time again. The tree is up and decorated with the tags of the names of needy children in our community. And while we had hoped that all the tags would have been taken and unwrapped gifts and prepaid gift cards would be returned by this weekend, there still are a bunch of tags on that tree. So if you haven't had the opportunity to and would like to, please stop in and take a tag and shop. Or if shopping is not your jam, just buy a prepaid $25 gift card at a local department store or grocery store and get that to the church office as soon as possible. We are still seeking sponsors for poinsettias to decorate the sanctuary on Christmas Eve. Though technically the deadline is past due, I can still squeeze you in. Just call the church office to reserve yours or go to the website zionohio.org, click on the Give tab, and buy a poinsettia from there. Live Nativity is scheduled for Sunday afternoon, December the 18th, and we are recruiting cookie bakers, kitchen crews, set up and clean up, cast, and cash donations. If you can help us out, please sign up at the Welcome Center or call the church office. The church, as you can tell, is already putting on its festive finery. We could still use your help in decorating. The next decorating dates are December the 20th and the 23rd. Please plan on participating. The special ministry opportunity for the month of December is Zion's Debt Reduction and Local Benevolence. To make a special offering or to contribute your regular tithes and offerings, I suggest using the ZionOhio.org website and click on the Give tab, or you can use this handy QR code located in the lower corner of your screen. Just point the camera of your smartphone at it, and it will take you to the ZionOhio.org website Give tab. You can also reach us by the U.S. mail. Assisting in worship today are Joan Gent, our Administrator of Worship and Music on the Keyboards, Michelle Vargo will be leading us in our singing and providing special music, Carol Jesse will be leading us in our prayers of intercession, Kari Wentz, our Administrator of Communications, produced the video, Eric Vargo edited the video, and Stephanie Chismar, our Director of Choirs, edited the music. Lighting the Advent wreath this morning are members of the Chaplow family. Now, join in singing our gathering hymn.
The first candle reminds us of a starry night in a quiet stable when God changed the course of human history. Our hope is firm, for in our Savior's birth, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The second candle symbolizes God's perfect peace in an imperfect world. The season of Advent calls us to turn our eyes to the Prince of Peace, who has come and will come again. According to Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Mrs. Janine Hankey, the administrator of Zion Christian Early Learning Center, bought this adorable Nativity Advent calendar as a way to teach the children the Nativity story, the birth of Jesus. You know how these things work. There are 25 little compartments here, and each day she was to open one and see what was inside and then tell the children how that particular piece went into the nativity story. Well, as you can see, she destroyed the entire package, and that's because at Zion Christian Early Learning Center, uh, Jesus, baby Jesus, has to uh, have a premature birth. That's right. Uh, he has to come before Christmas Eve because the children are not in school or in church on Christmas Eve, and everyone knows that the three wise men had to come to the scene, and in order to get them there while the scene is still set up, they have to also arrive there uh, the last week of Advent. Because everybody knows that by the time January the 6th comes around, the nativity scene and all the Christmas ornaments and the Christmas tree are down and maybe kicked to the curb, so you got to get it all in in a short amount of time. My parents, pastor, used to move Mary and Joseph from a place in the back of the sanctuary a little closer every Sunday of Advent as a way of reminding the children that Mary and Joseph were on the way to Bethlehem. 
I like the idea, but in my opinion, to be truly authentic, we need a pregnant Mary on a donkey. And not just a pregnant Mary on a donkey, but a pregnant Mary who gets bigger each week along the way. I can imagine this. Maybe there's a knob in her back and every week you give it a turn and she gets a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger to the point where on Christmas Eve she arrives in all her pregnant glory at Bethlehem. Well, all we ever see in our nativity scenes is this thin peasant Mary with not an ounce of postpartum weight. It's a conundrum, isn't it? You know what else you never see? John the Baptist. Seriously, he shows up every Advent, but you will never find a John the Baptist character figure to go into your nativity set either. But that would surely mess with, mess with people, wouldn't it? Because you see, John the Baptizer was a contemporary of Jesus, only being a few months older, so would John the Baptizer be characterized as another baby in the nativity scene, or as the bearded grown-up? It's a conundrum. How could it be that we have the pregnant Mary on a donkey being led to Bethlehem by Joseph, and over in the corner of the scene there is John? We would really have to have a back-to-the-future moment to make that happen, wouldn't we? So today's gospel reading presents us with an interruption in that journey toward Bethlehem by John the Baptist every Advent, and it is quite a conundrum. We really don't know what to do with him. John and his message, albeit an inconvenient conundrum, is a central theme to Advent. John foretold, actually I've always imagined him as loud, a yeller, John proclaimed the coming of God's Messiah, but no one, not even John, expected his coming as a baby in a Bethlehem stable, but as a man who was born to become the Messiah, who is the Savior of the world. And so, on this weekend, the second weekend of Advent, we are presented with a conundrum. This John, John the Baptist, invades our simple nativity scene just as his message invades our happy and pleasant lives. In the days immediately before Jesus began his ministry, God sent his prophet John to prepare the way for his coming. This wild and woolly prophet went out and in his zeal invaded the traditions of the religious people of his day. Like a street corner preacher, he showed up unexpectedly at the Jordan River without a permit, without a license, without a diploma, without credentials of ordination, but with a passion energized by the Spirit of God to speak the truth of God. In today's Gospel, we hear Matthew declaring simply that in those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea. He burst onto the scene without the affirmation of the religious authority, but with a call from God. In this invasion, John spoke of another invasion to come, an invasion that would be mighty and lasting, actually everlasting. He said that God would be sending the most powerful leader ever to defeat all the powers the world could muster. This invasion is already underway. God's Messiah is coming, John said to those of old. And on this second Sunday of Advent, he says it to us still. He is coming, and you better get ready for what he brings and what he reveals about God and us. John the Baptist invades the spirits of his hearers with a word of judgment, his way of making us prepare for the coming Christ. John calls us to self-examination and confession. He demands that we look in the mirror 
but not merely look at a reflection of ourselves. No, John demands that we stare into our eyes and see beyond that which others see to examine what is really at our core, the reality of our lives, at the dirt and sin that separate us from God, who is so holy that God cannot bear to look upon us in our sinful state. And so God has a conundrum too. If you've ever done this, the real laborious work of self-examination, then you know it can be a disturbing process. But having looked deeply at that which we would really prefer no one else know about us, we can confess those areas to God, receive God's forgiveness, and begin the process of being and doing better in our goal of holy living, and not for that end alone, but so that we draw closer to God, who is, so, who is no longer put off by our sinfulness. So God's answer to God's conundrum of our separation from God is John and his message of repentance. Let me give you a personal example. Carol and I think about retirement more now than ever before. Those of you who are there know that we think of uh, what we think and talk about. Can we afford it? When is the time right? If we stop earning and saving before we have enough, what happens to us when we run out of money? It could be a conundrum for us. But in this stage of life, when we look in the mirror, we don't want to see someone who is less generous because we are thinking only of ourselves. Ones who have turned in on ourselves and neglect God's call to serve him and serve those whom he loves, namely the poor and those devastated by natural disasters, etc. So Carol and I have increased our giving to our church, knowing that it is doing godly work, and we continue to give to the numerous causes that we have supported for many years. The question that all of us are confronted with today is, can we let John invade our thoughts by hearing him call us to look deeply at what we are without God? The answer would be nothing. And to look at what part we may have to play in contributing by action or inaction to a broken world Closer to home, that question is, is saving every penny for retirement a good and right thing to do when natural disasters and famines and wars continue to disrupt the lives of innocent people who are also created and loved by God and I trust with my life? Or will I continue to serve God who has safely gotten me this far and who promises that come what may will take me home. You take your life situation and ask yourself the same questions. If you can work through the discomfort of self-examination, how much are you like that brood of vipers that John spoke of? How much good fruit have you not produced? Now we are beginning to see why John the Baptist is never invited to our Advent and Christmas celebrations. He's a buzzkill. But if we listen to John, listen closely, John invades the spirits of his hearers with a second word, a word of hope. Because you see, hope is on the way. The judgment is not the last message, only the first. The reason for self-examination and confession is so that we can repent, which means to turn ourselves around and face Godward. It means changing our lives for the better. And if we are serious about changing, it means that we can begin to change the directions of our lives. And then we resolve to do so we change our direction and choose God's way rather than our own. You see, each of us must listen to this crude prophet, John the Baptist, 
who invades our pleasant Advent seasons. We listen to him in this season by preparing our way for the Lord, preparing our way so God can renew us and change us into the people who act and live by following the example of his son that he gave to us. And more than merely act and live by following the example of Jesus, when we do, we participate in the healing of this broken world. Yes, every Advent we are presented with a conundrum. How do we fit John the baptizer into our nativity scenes? He just doesn't fit. And yet, here he is again. John invades our lives to make sure that we know that Jesus, who is born of Mary and Joseph, is also born to us. Born to set us free from our materialistic and self-centered values in the world. And so each Advent, the church sees fit to invite John back, the awkward guest at the party, because John's mission was and is to make sure that we know that Jesus is coming to save us so that we may become his children and follow his way. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the eccentricity and courage of servants like John, who came not with words of love that stroke our complacency, but rather with challenges that irritate us to action. Help each of us to prepare for your son's promised return by true reflection and repentance, so that we will be prepared for Jesus' promised return. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our long-awaited Messiah. Amen. <laughs>
been made God's people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for the world that yearns for the new hope. God, you renew the church in every age. We give thanks for hymn writers and theologians, inspire teachers, writers, and musicians to delight and instruct your people. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You give us a vision of creation in harmony when hurting and destruction will be no more. Teach us to be stewards of the earth and companions of its creatures. Restore to balance and wholeness what human greed has harmed. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You defend the cause of all who are poor and oppressed. Raise up leaders who will govern with equity and serve the common good. Guide judges, lawmakers, and public officials to protect the rights of those who cannot advocate for themselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You deliver those in need from suffering and fear. Come to the aid of any who are exploited or abused, especially children, elders, and victims of human trafficking. Provide safety and help to our neighbors without shelter, refugees, and those fleeing violence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You urge your people to welcome one another as you have welcomed us. Nurture ministries of hospitality and care in this and every congregation. We pray for people who are homebound, hospitalized, or separated from loved ones, especially those on our prayer list, our homebound, and those we now name before you, either silently or aloud. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You embrace all who have died trusting in your promises, and we give thanks for their faithful witness. Sustain us in hope until we are united with them in the joy of your eternal presence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your Spirit, gather our prayers and join them with all the prayers of your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, singing the Lord's Prayer. sending him. with us in Jesus and holds us in the grace of the Holy Spirit bless us now and forever amen you belong here we belong together hope is on the way thanks be to God